I will walk you. I will walk you through the definition and the properties of nanomaterials, their sources in the environment, their applications, and finally, nanotoxicology. Did you know nanomaterials? What's that? We all know that nanometer is one billionth of a meter. That's about 100,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair, a thousand times smaller than a red blood cell, all about half the size of the diameter of DNA. So this figure illustrates the scale of objects in the nanometer range. So nanoparticle or nanomaterial is defined as materials that have at least one dimension between one and 100 nanometers. Although the de uh, definition here is well within the mainstream of current acceptance, the definition is still on the debate with different studies setting the upper size limit at 100 nanometers or some other nanometers. This is because the size-based technical definitions may be insufficient from their applications and risk assessment. For example, at uh, up to 1,000 nanometers, we can see from this figure, these nanoparticles could still cross the biological barriers. So the unique nanoscale phases affect the interfacial reactivity and the intrinsic properties of nanomaterials. For example, the bond gap energy corresponding to the fluorescence wavelengths increases as diameter decreases below six to eight nanometers. Another example is a melting point of T nanoparticles. When their size decreased from 100 to 10 nanometers, the melting point is reduced by 80 degree. Also, the decrease in particle size increases the energy of quantum dots. This graph sh shows the size dependent chemical properties of nanoparticles. Iron oxide is used as solvents of arsenic because its huge desorption capacity. When the amount of arsenic was normalized by specific surface area, 300 nanometer as shown here and 20 nanometer iron oxide particles are observed to absorb similar amount of arsenic, indicating similar absorption mechanism are included over this size range. Surprisingly, for particles smaller than 20 nanometer, the absorption capacity increases with 11 nanometer particles absorbing three times more arsenic per square nanometer than do 20 nanometer particles. These large values indicate a change in the surface structure leading to the appearance of new surface absorption sites and a significant decrease in the surface energy. The red panel shows a number of physical chemical mechanisms occur at the surface of an inorganic nanoparticle, including science dependence of the crystalline structure of nanoparticles, interfacial properties such as dissolution, oxidation, adsorption, desorption, electrotransfer, redox cycles, and fighting reactions. In addition to particle size, another property is particle number. Most of previous studies provide only mass-based concentrations of nanoparticles. As you can see clearly in this figure, although the total mass concentrations are the same for both suspensions, the particle number differ distinctly. It illustrated the inadequacy of mass concentration to account for increased particle number interactions at a smaller particle number uh, at smaller particle diameters. So with a decrease in the uh, particle size, the particle number concentration increase. Therefore, particle number concentration is recommended um, the mass concentration as an exposure matrix. Another important factor to consider is the surface area. 
on a mass concentration, toxicity of different nanosilver increased with decreasing particle size. Normalizing exposure to surface area largely eliminates differences between uh, the exposure response curves. In other words, the toxicity of any sizes of nanoparticle nanosilver at the same mass concentrations of total silver were inherently associated with the surface area. The nanoparticle shape is also an important consideration. This TEM emergence allows us to see different shapes of chemin sulfide in the environment, thus chemin sulfide sphere, rod, and sheet. Different shapes of nanoparticles would have different chemical reactivity, such as dissolution. It is clear that the spherical nanoparticles have the lowest dissolution rate, as indicated by the red dashed line. In contrast, the chemin sulfide in sheet have the greatest dissolution, as suggested by the orange dashed line. The biological reactivity of nanoparticles also depend on particle surface charge. Positively charged nanoplastics, as shown here, had a stronger effect on the root and on the seed, uh, seedling development, as well as the living size in roots. This could be attributed to the electrostatic attac attraction between the nanoplastics with positive charge and the cell wall in the root with negative charge. Well, electrostatic repulsion between uh, these nanoplastics with negative charge and the cell wall. So nanoparticles can be divided into three classes based on their sources. That is natural nanomaterials, uh, incidental nanomaterials, and engineered nanomaterials. Natural nanomaterials are made by nature uh, through biogeochemical or mechanical processes. Natural nanomaterials have been abundant during Earth's formation and through its evolution, including clays, metal, oxide, sulfides, carbonates, and phosphates. These nanomaterials play major biogeochemical roles. Incidental nanomaterials are those unintentionally produced as a result of direct or indirect human influence or anthropogenic processes, such as industrial, agriculture, and many activities. Engineered nanomaterials are conceived, designed, and intentionally produced by humans. So this figure shows that up to 0.3 teragrams of engineered nanomaterials enter the environment per year. Here are examples of natural nanomaterials. I perform a field survey in a many area in China. The soil samples were, anal were analyzed by single particle ICP mass. So this is the raw data. A pulse represents a nanoparticle. Thus, nanosilver were detected in these many soils. Another example is a white lime soil specked with silver ions. After several days of aging, nanosilver with particle size of 20 nanometers were detected by TEM EDS. So this brings us to the next point. How could this nanosilver form? Several studies have shown the formation of nanosilver by bacteria and fungi. This is associated with biological processes. How about the chemical processes of nanosilver formation? We focused on a particulate organic matter because it accounts for 30 to 70 percent of soil organic matter. And this poem is considered to be chemically inert in the past few years. When the poem was incubated with silver ions in sand matrix on the solar irradiation, Silver nanoparticles were detected as demonstrated by its surface plasma rosinase and TMEDS. The kinetics of silver nanoparticle formation were best described by the Fig-Walls model that involves two steps, 
by which silver ions was first reduced to zero valent atoms, followed by autocatalytic surface reduction. We further eliminate the inference from dissolved organic matter from palm and also the ash in the palm on the formation of silver nanoparticles. Moreover, the addition of superoxide dismutase diminished silver nanoparticle formation, indicating that superoxide mediate silver nanoparticle formation. EPR analysis coupled with DMTO as a spin trapping agent confirms the generation of superoxide. NMR and FTIR analysis shows that phenolite groups in POM were responsible for superoxide production under irradiation. It was estimated that the contribution of POM to the naturally silver nanoparticle is 11 to 31 percent. This study provides fresh insight in the natural sources of silver nanoparticles in soil. An example of incidental nanomaterial is steel silver nanoparticle, which is produced by microplastics. We all know that microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment. In the sand matrix and natural water, when silver ions and the PS microplastics were incubated under irradiation, so nanosilver were detected either by LCACT mass or TM EDS. The formation of silver nanoparticle follows the first order kinetics. Reduction rate constant, constants induced by PS microplastics were within the values documented for dissolved organic matter in literature. Therefore, PS or the micro weathered microplastics could also act as an efficient driver of silver nanoparticle formation. The so FTIR spectra suggests that PS under irradiation had a unique absorbance of carbonyl groups. The importance of carbonyl groups for silver nanoparticle formation was further underscored by the significant linear relationship between the contents of carbonyl groups and the newly formed silver nanoparticles. Further, the addition of copper as an oxidizer <laughs> of aldehydes induce a concentration dependent inhibition of silver nanoparticle formation. So this suggests a critical role of aldehydes on silver, uh, on silver nanoparticle formation. Although P POM and PS could induce the formation of silver nanoparticles, their chemical mechanisms are distinct. And then now we are moving to the next slide where we are going to have a closer understanding of engineered nanomaterials. Engineered nanomaterials can be synthesized by two pathways. The first process is a bottom up that creates nanoparticles from atoms and molecules. The other process is top down that creates nanoparticles from their micro scale counterparts. The most abundant engineered nanomaterials are carbon-based natural materials, uh, metal-based materials, and dentimers. Engineered nanomaterials are applied in various uh, fields such as consumer products, nanomedicine, nanoagriculture, and environmental remediation. Engineered nanomaterials are everywhere in our daily life. In human health, silver nanoparticles is used as wood dressing due to its antibacterial properties. Silver nanoparticles and good nanoparticles are included in cosmetics to provide up to 24-hour antibacterial protection. Zinc oxides and titanium dioxides are used in sun screens to defense solar irradiation. In electronics and computers, quantum dots are both photoactive and electroactive and used in computer displays. Textiles contain nanomaterials with specific functions, including hydrophobicity, antibacterial properties, conductivity, and light guidance and scattering. For example, 
cotton fabrics were colored using gold nanoparticles and displayed on a garment. In addition, there are nanomaterials in food packaging, such as milk bags and food additives. Nanomaterials have also been used in medicine to deliver drugs to tumors. However, a median of 0.7% of the injected dose of the nanoparticles reached the tumor. This suggests that only seven out of 1,000 administrated nanoparticles actually entered a solid tumor in a mouse model. Furthermore, the median delivery efficiency has not improved sustainably between uh, 2005 to 2015. So this indicates the great challenge for nanoparticles to deliver uh, drugs to tumors. However, several trends can be observed in this data. First, the delivery efficiency depends on the cancer type and also the nanoparticles of inorganic materials tends to provide a greater delivery efficiency than those made from organic material. Second, particles with hydrodynamic diameters smaller than 100 nanometer tend to show a greater delivery efficiency than larger particles. Third, the rod shaped nanoparticles tend to exhibit a greater delivery efficiency than the spherical particles, plate particles, or flake particles. So this is cons consistent with the uh, uh, unique properties of nanoparticles we mentioned previously. So under the novel cor coronavirus, most of the vaccines candidates rely on either Sensitech or naturally occurring nanoscale vector systems, with almost all of the candidates falling within the nanoscale size range. This figure shows the nanoscale coronavirus-19 vaccines authorized for emergency clinic use or in phase three active trials and the institutions that have developed and all market them. Nanotechnology also offers potential solutions to sustainable agriculture, including increasing nutrient utilization efficiency, improving the efficiency of pest management, mitigating the impacts of climate change, and reducing adverse environmental impacts of agricultural food production. For example, nanopesticides potentially have higher efficiency and help to prevent runoff to surface water and groundwater. Nanotechnology-based genetic engineering offers tremendous advantages. Nanotechnology might be used to modify the soil microbial or in soil conditioning, and the nanocarrier-bound fertilizer may exhibit higher delivery efficiencies than conventional products. Nano-enabled seed coating may improve seed quality. Most applications are still at research stage due to uncertainties regarding safety and complex and emerging re regulatory process for approving of agricultural chemistries, chemicals. So this is an example of nanopesticides. The analysis reveals that nanopesticides are average uh, 31.5% more efficient than their non-scale non counterparts. The overall efficiency of nanopesticides against a uh, target organism in field test is on average 18.9% greater than their counterparts, although the difference is not significant. Further, nanopesticides exhibit 43.1% uh, less toxicity to non-target organisms at a significant level. Among the nanopesticides, nanosilver and copper as bell sites have been commercially used. The nanopesticides market was valued at US dollars 500 million in 2020 and is expected to grow at an annual growth rate of over 15% 
from 2020 to 2027. Similar to nanotechnology's success in consumer products and other sectors, nanomaterials have promising environmental applications. Environmental remediation includes the degradation, sequestration, or other approaches that result in reduced risk to human and environment health. In this ways, nanotechnology presents an opportunity to improve how to measure, monitor, manage, or reduce contaminants in the environment. The benefits from usage of nanomaterials for remediation could include cost-effective cleanup of waste more rapidly. Such benefits may derive from the large surface area, enhanced reactivity, and or sequestration characteristics of nanomaterials. A variety of different nanomaterials can be used for remediation of soils, water, and air. The main mechanism includes the adsorption, solvents, filtration, chemical reactions, and the photocatalyst. Here is a picture of nanoscale zero valent ion encapsulated in an emulsion droplet. These nanoparticles have been used for remediation of sites contaminated with organic pollutants. Let me draw your attention on nanomaterials in water treatment. For example, these nanoparticles could be used to control biofouling. Silver nanoparticles release silver ions for bacteria in activation, and the graphene oxide nanosheets interactivate microorganisms via direct contact. And graphene oxide and silver nanocomposites could combine both mechanisms. Some nanomaterials, such as titanium dioxide, are photocatalysts. They absorb and pre-concentrate high-priority pollutants on the surface and oxidize these pollutants into more biodegradable byproducts or catalyze the conversion of undesirable forms to less toxic forms. Superpyromagnetic nanoparticles can be decorated with selected absorption size, catalysts, or antibacterial uh, agents. They are used in various applications, such as removing of pollutants from industrial water to drinking water treatment, followed with low energy recovery and reuse. High capacity solvents could remove arsenic, as we showed previously, selenium, and chromium. Selectivity could be achieved through modifying their physical chemical properties. In summary, some of, uh, some of the same special properties that makes nanomaterials useful are also properties that may cause some nanomaterials to pose hazards to humans and to the environment under specific conditions. For example, some nanomaterials are able to pass through the cell membrane or cross the blood-brain barrel. This is beneficial for their usage as targeted drug delivery, but could result in unintended impacts in other applications. Since there's not enough information to assess the environmental exposure for most engineered nanomaterials, this would be critical to ensure the sustainability of nanotechnology. That is, we fully realize the social benefits of nanotechnology while identifying and minimizing the adverse impacts to humans or environment. Thus, information about safety and the potential hazards is urgently needed. This is the basis for the expanding field of nanotoxicology which could be defined as safety evaluation of engineered nanomaterials. The risk assessment of engineered nanomaterials require multidisciplinary data. For example, the toxicology tests are based on the biological medicines. The quantum effect aggregation kinetics and nano size effect depends on physics and surface chemistry is associated with chemistry. 
This figure shows the information registered in Web of Science on various types of nanomaterials since 1980. About 1% 1 of the publications focus on nanotoxicology and 0.1% for nanoecotoxicology. The most extensively studied nanomaterials are carbon nanomaterials, uh, cotton dots, gold and silver nanoparticles, fluorences, and dentrimers. Till now, it's still a great challenge to quantify the concentrations of nanoparticles in different environmental metrics due to the dilute concentrations of nanoparticles and the inference from nature nanomaterials such as clays. Using a dynamic public modeling, the evolution of concentrations of nano titanium dioxide and nano zinc oxide in the European Union from 1990 to 2020 is modeled. The general idea is that the concentration of all nanoparticles in all compartments are increasing. The predicted nano concentra nanoparticle concentration in environment compartments are shown in this table. In general, for all nanomaterials, the highest concentration is found in sewage sludge, followed by solid waste, waste incineration plants bottom ash, and waste incineration plants fly ash. Among the environmental compartments, sediment had great, uh, higher nanomaterials than other, nano, uh, than other compartments, followed, um, followed by sludge treated soil, then untreated soil and surface water. In all of the compartments, nano titanium dioxide had higher concentrations than other nanoparticles. Sediments showed accumulated concentration ranging from 6.7 microgram uh, per kilogram for carbon nanotube to about 40,000 uh, microgram per kilogram nano titanium dioxide. These estimated concentrations provide ecotoxicologists and risk assessors with crucial exposure data. So in fact, there are special issue, issues on nature nanotechnology and environmental science and technology, which concern the opportunities and the challenges in, nanotech, in nanotechnology. In the next several sections, we will have presentations from researchers with a wide diversity of background on nanoparticles. So here's the main points in the presentation. We learned that nanomaterial is size-based defined. It has unique physical chemical properties. Among their properties, size, shape, particle number, surface area, and surface chemistry are critical for their behaviors in the environment. Secondly, not all nanomaterials are engineered, and there are natural and incidental nanomaterials in the environment. And in our study, both particular organic matter and microplastics contribute to silver nanoparticles on the solar irradiation. Thirdly, nanomaterials are widely used in consumer products, nano medicine, nano agriculture, and environmental remediation. And finally, Nanotoxicology is a multidisciplinary narrow field to evaluate the safety and the potential hazards of nanoparticles. Of priority is their environment concentrations in the compartments, which remains a huge challenge for analysis. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Bay, for that uh, excellent introduction. Um, you've covered a wide range of, of topics that, as you uh, suggested, uh, further lectures in this series will delve into uh, in much more detail. Um, I would say to all of those who are listening that uh, one of the purposes of these uh, seminar series are to provide opportunities for people to uh, get to know uh, people around the world and uh, ultimately to um, facilitate interactions. So, Feel free to open your cameras if you wish, so people can actually see who is talking uh, as you ask questions. 
Um, and at this point, I would invite uh, anyone who has questions uh, for Faye to go ahead and uh, ask them. And maybe while people are uh, thinking about that, because people are always shy to ask questions, um, uh, Faye, I was really interested in the drug delivery uh, data yeah. that you showed, which yeah. um, is terribly inefficient. Uh, and so presumably the rest of the almost 99% or more of the drugs uh, that are delivered via that mechanism then are eliminated from the body and uh, yeah. ultimately go into um, the waste stream. How stable are those complexes uh, once they're eliminated from the body? So uh, probably some researcher later will introduce the um, delivery efficiency of these nanoparticles in the drug. Uh, from my point of view, that's because the complexity of the uh, body. For example, we have different uh, biological bar barriers and uh, how could nanoparticles, uh, these nanoparticles could uh, transform uh, for example, uh, by forming protein coroner or react with other uh, um, biomoleculars uh, to change their species. So in that case, uh, these pristine nanoparticles will uh, behave distinctly uh, compared with uh, these transformed nanoparticles. And in that case, the delivery efficiency is limited due to the different biological barriers. For example, the blood, uh, uh, the blood brain barriers, and uh, or uh, for example, the intestinal uh, microbiome, they all could influence the delivery if, uh, efficiency of these nanoparticles. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some questions that have been uh, put up on chat. Maybe yeah. start with one from uh, Jacob Bothan. Have you come across selenium nanoparticles in your research before? Uh, he's curious if there are many studies on them since they're involved in solar panels. Uh, in fact, I didn't come across selenium nanoparticles, but I noticed some a lot of papers using uh, selenium nanoparticles to uh, remediate the soil contamination, for example, the chemin, uh, chemin contamination and uh, uh, other trace metals. But um, in fact, I didn't synthesize or buy these kinds of nanoparticles in my research. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Margaret Graham in Edinburgh, uh, treatment of tumors, if uh, she understands correctly. You said the inorganic nanoparticles are better than organic nanoparticles in terms of the efficient drug delivery. Why is that? And is the surface charge important in that context? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, it's not uh, my conclusion. It's a conclusion from, uh, from a nature review materials. The authors uh, use the meta-analysis to show the delivery efficiency of different nanomaterials. And the results show that the inorganic nanoparticles are better than organic nanoparticles. But the difference is minor. I think uh, probably 0.7% versus 0.6%. Uh, it's a minor, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a minor uh, difference. But the authors uh, suggest that they are significant. So I don't know uh, whether uh, why uh, the, the reasons for the inorganic uh, matters, uh, yeah, inorganic nanoparticles uh, better than the organic nanoparticles. I think probably a lot of factors uh, will influence it. For example, the coin formation uh, in the inorganic nanoparticles or some other factors. Uh, also in the paper published in Nature Reviews materials, they do not provide explanations for this. Surface charge is important in the interfacial uh, interactions, but may not that important uh, when nanoparticles enter into the body. 
So that's my thoughts. Uh, thank you. And I, and I think we will have a speaker later on in the series who might also be able to yeah. um, shed some light on that. So we'll we'll remember that question for later. Um, I have a question uh, from Ian Oliver uh, from Kiel, uh, who uh, asks, um, uh, for nanoparticles used in water treatment, is it likely to be economically viable to recover and reuse the nanoparticles, or is it too expensive and difficult to remove them from the contaminants? So that's a good question. Uh, for the nanotechnology, uh, for researchers who support for nanotechnology, uh, they think they are uh, recovery and they are high efficient than the conventional products. However, if we consider the economics cost for this uh, water treatment, I don't know because I'm not an expert on water treatment. <laughs> I'm more focused on the uh, soil remediation. Uh, probably uh, we will collect data for uh, the economic loss, uh, economic basis for the uh, water treatment. Thank you. Uh, Faye, I have another question for you. Um, yeah. It relates to the slide that you showed on the increase in nanoparticle concentrations in a variety of different compartments uh, for the EU. Yeah. Uh, and, and the conclusion that one comes to from the the figures is that there is a, a you know, significant increase in nanoparticles in all sorts of different environmental compartments. But yeah. you also showed that um, incidental uh, nanoparticle uh, formation is much larger than uh, the uh, release of engineered particles. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to get my, my head around what's driving the, the sorts of increases that they're seeing in these various compartments. Do you think it's exclusively from the increase in use of engineered uh, particles, or is there is it possible that things like um, climate change are affecting the amount of uh, incidental particles that we're finding in the various compartments? Uh, in fact, uh, the increase of uh, nanoparticle concentrations in the European Union is modeled by Bernd Nowak. They use a prohibit model to model the concentrations. So th th this is just a model. So and another issue is that they modeled the engineered nanoparticles. They, I, I don't think they have uh, considered the natural nanomaterials. In fact, nano, uh, natural nanomaterials is in a huge amount compared to the uh, engineered nanoparticles, as shown in my first slides, in the paper published in science, in science have, uh, have, have uh, noted this uh, phenomenon. So the increase of uh, nanoparticle concentration in the European Union is probably due to the application of engineered nanoparticles in our daily life, in medicine, uh, and also uh, in environmental remediation. But in fact, the uh, natural nanoparticles could also uh, in a dynamic change due to the climate change and due to uh, human activities. For example, when, we are, um, when there's a mining site there will be more uh, incidental nanomaterials. Yeah, so um, our understanding on the sources of nanoparticles and their concentrations are still uh, under in, uh, increasing due to the technology advancement. Yes, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that um, uh, one of the reasons why we decided to hold this series is because it is uh, such an emerging field and there really is uh, so much uh, left for us to understand in this area. Uh, any other questions that people would like to ask, uh, Faye? Yeah, 
If not, um, let me just give you a preview of what to expect in the upcoming weeks. For the next two weeks, we will have uh, speakers um, on uh, analytical uh, aspects of uh, measuring uh, nanoparticles. Next week, it will be Kevin Wilkinson from the University of Montreal who will be speaking. Uh, and then uh, after the two uh, weeks of um, uh, analytical focused uh, talks, we will then move into agriculture and uh, have a couple of weeks of talks on applications and uh, fate of nanoparticles in agricultural uh, systems. Uh, and then we will work our way into aquatic uh, systems. And ultimately, uh, further on in the series, we will get into some of the, uh, the health implications, the environmental fate, and uh, some of the other questions that have uh, arisen um, in today's talk. So I would uh, encourage and, and uh, welcome you all to join us each week uh, at the same time for these talks. I want to thank you again, Faye, for your excellent uh, start to this series. We really appreciate uh, your effort here. Um, and uh, one last uh, chance if there are any further questions. Otherwise, we will uh, uh, say goodbye for today and uh, see you next week. So thank you all. Thank you.